Okay, so we are recording now. Mm -hmm. So last time we um, we started to like give an introduction about ArcGIS and how we process data. So I showed you how the buildings as a polygon look like and how we can convert them to points. Like we can convert feature to points or feature to polygons or line to points. So there is different ways that we can do it. And, but how can we get data? So it's a very easy, it's very simple. You just like go to Google and Google the data that you would like to. Like here, for example, I was doing some search before I come here. Like North Carolina, I go, there is a, you say North Carolina buildings GIS data. And then let's go down. The first fuse will be, uh, will be ads. So you will go from here, search for building footprints. So I'll click on this one and it will open a page. It's, um, it should be, oh yeah, this one. So here is the North Carolina building footprint 2010. And I believe this data have more than 5 million buildings. So if you click on this one, I tried to download this before, but it didn't work because I believe it was large, but you can try to download them. Uh, but I had to communicate with them so that is they send me the compressed files. But if you look county by county or city by city, you can get decent data for North Carolina. Like, like look for Robinson County for us, Lumberton City. Uh, you can find the data. So you will go here. And then you click download the data so you can download this data same thing with any data like we are working on galveston county so what i will write here galveston county buildings gis data sometimes it's a tricky and it takes lots of time to get this data but at some point you will be able to to how to locate this data and then you will keep searching for what data that you look that you are looking for until you get this data. Also, one trick that I use is um, there is a website with ArcGIS, ArcGIS Online. When you go on ArcGIS Online, it's a, it's a very big community. It has lots of people in this community. They upload lots of data. Many people actually doesn't work on ArcGIS desktop and work on ArcGIS Online, and then they share their work. Uh, on ArcGIS online. Go search for whatever data that you like to. Like you can go to Microsoft Buildings Footprint and then search for the data. You will find Microsoft Building Footprint here. And here you go. Uh, any city, this is also one of the sources that I use. So this for features, if I'm looking for buildings data, uh, or networks like power, water, transportation, this can be useful. Uh, how about if I'm looking for digital elevation maps? What if I want raster data? I want to raster data. Actually, you can find on ArcGIS online, you can find some raster data. Also, the websites of the cities, like uh, so, same sources. When you search, you search for digital elevation maps, and you can say rasters. So to be more specific for, for Galveston County. Okay, so here you will find there's some with Noah. You can go here and check what they have here. Uh, but actually what I use, there's two websites that have very high resolution digital elevation maps, NOAA and USGIS, uh, USGS. So basically there is a website uh, you can search with NOAA LIDAR imagery. So the LIDAR based digital elevation models is one of the highest resolution digital elevation models. You can get digital elevation models with resolution up to one meter by one meter or two meter by two meter, which is very, very fine resolution. Uh, however, USGS, it provides digital elevation models with much higher, like, I mean, like, the, the pixel size is much bigger, like maybe 10 meter by 10 meter. This is the maximum that you can get. So let's try NOAA LiDAR Im uh, imagery. So here you will find NOAA data access viewer. And then you will go to imagery. Sorry, you will go to elevation and LiDAR because we are looking for elevation data. We need a raster map that tells me what is the elevation on the ground. So I'll click on elevation and LiDAR. 
And then you will search for, for example, Galveston. Galveston. Texas, yeah, this one. All right, let's see what we have. It has lots of data. The first one, it will give you a LIDAR map to based on 2018, but actually this is points cloud. Like, uh, so the, the house the LIDAR was generated, it's just like a light and the light uh, emit, uh, like it will be points and you will have to convert these points into rasters. So you will have to do processing. And that's that's not what we are looking for. We are looking for a, a, like a processed raster, like the map, and I need to use the map right away. So what I look for, not points, I'm looking for something like this like the processed one, this is the one. So somebody takes these points, when the lights, when the lights of the LiDAR, because LiDAR is light detection. So you make lights and based on the lights, how it hits the ground, it gives you the elevation. So you have millions of points with elevation. You take these points and do some data processing and then convert it to raster. So we don't want to do this process. So I will choose the second one. Can you see the size of this one? It's 3.92 gigabyte just for, this one. So somebody process this data and give you the LIDAR dim, not the LIDAR, just then means digital elevation map. Somebody created this map. However, we are not interested for this entire region. We just need this island. So maybe we have something. Yeah, this one. This one is like much smaller for the island. So I can download this one. So what you do, you put it in your cart and then you go fill some information about your email, your, uh, where you work, and then you submit a job and then he will send you an email. He created your file. Maybe in a few minutes, you can get this data. So this is one way to get digital elevation maps. Also, there is a, like, if you searched them, there's the elevation map, USGS. I'm giving you some idea because for the project in this class, you might have to search for some data on your own, but I will try to give you some hints where to search or maybe give you the data that you need. So, but you might end up with like, need some more data. Okay, so here, them USGS, United States Geological Survey. I will go here and it will, it, it will open up website, get maps. Let's get maps. Download this, this one. Oh, what is this? So here I found the link. It says one meter digital elevation model. So I go here. Uh, I think there's other website. Create one demand. Okay. USGS elevation data. Right. Is, I think I have it saved somewhere here. GIS links, yeah, this one. Yeah, it's called TNM, you search with TNM that USGS. So basically you search, like you zoom in here in the map, let's go to Houston, Texas, Galveston. And then when I get here, so when you zoom in, it will reduce the search to the area that you are zooming in. And what I'm looking for is elevation data. So I click, I check this box and I'm looking for not LIDAR points. I don't need points. I need them, digital elevation models. Okay, sorry, we, we will search elevation products and we are looking for Maybe, so one over nine, I believe this is the highest resolution that we can get, maybe, or one over three arc. So the arc is the, like the earth is 30, 360 degrees. One arc is one degree. Like he gets you a size of a digital elevation map of one arc. If we are looking for one over three arc, so it's one third of the degree or one ninth of the degree. So this is the resolution of the digital elevation model. So, and then I will, 
I will hit search for products. And then you will end up with finding some maps. So if I zoom out, so here, this piece, that's what I talked about last time. You will not find your like your raster maps as a one piece. Sometimes you find it as a pieces and you need to merge them together. This is the case here. This raster map or this digital elevation map only covers this part. This one covered the next part. This one is another one, but the difference between these two, they are taken at different dates. This one is 2021, this one 2018. So I'm looking for the recent one. So we might take this one and this one. So this one. All right. So if it's like if it's like not the recent is exists, so we might use the old one. So the size of each one of these is like half gigabyte. I downloaded them yesterday. So um, we came here at the digital elevation map, and I believe. Okay, let me get to um, where I downloaded them. Yesterday. Oh. All right, these two maps. Each one is like half gigabytes. So let's get them here. So basically you can add data, like you can open from the content. You can have the content here on the left and you can open it. If you don't have these uh, like lists on the left side, you will find them here. So you can find, this is the con the catalog. This is the search. This is the Arc Toolbox. If I close them and they are not in the left side, you can open them from here and then you can bend them on the left bar, like what I did. I usually have this three on the left bar because I use them all the time. I keep adding data, keep doing processing. So I go to a catalog and and then I will go to my laptop where I have this data somewhere here. Yeah, I will find the two raster files at this location. I will add them and it tells me about the um, projection. I will zoom, zoom to the layer. Okay, so this is our first one. Actually, it covered my area until this location. I believe the second one will cover the rest part. Okay, right now I have the two raster maps get together and we need to merge them. So let's learn a new tool. How can we merge these two raster files? If you. There's still a vision map in the rest of my part. Yeah. So the elevations is rasters, the hazards are rasters. So all these are raster maps. Uh, and actually, this uh, these colors, can you see the darker color and the lighter color? The lighter is the much higher elevation. So the lighter is like 80, uh, I believe this is in meters. So, okay, if you are confused about if an elevation is in meter or is in feet and you cannot find a source to search in, because sometimes it's very vague, like let's go here and see if it's if it's have info about what is the uh, the units of this raster maps. Okay, doesn't have any sources, anything about the units of this map. So what I do, I go to Google Maps and then do you guys remember when I put my, my cruiser on a land and tells you the feet? Go at the same location at the digital elevation map and see if it's if they do match or not. Like if it says 15 feet on the Google Earth and on the map that you have, it say uh, like five. So that means that they are different. But if you look, this might be five meter because if I multiply five by three, it will be 15 and this is 15 feet. So this map is in, is a meter, but what I measured, it was in feet. So this is how I know, this is how I, uh, I do it. 
Okay, so this, I believe these values are in meters. So what I do, you will go to the arc toolbox and then there is a tool. If you don't know how to merge them, you go to YouTube, search how to merge rasters. You'll find this, you'll find in YouTube the same thing that I'm gonna do right now. So you'll have data management tool and I will go to rasters and rasters, you will find raster data set. You'll find something is called mosaic to new rasters. So I will click on this tool and I will add my two rasters. These two, I will put them here. So input the rasters and then it asks you about the output location. So I put my output location uh, here, classes or class, this lecture, them. Okay, I put my, the destination where I want to save the new data. It should load here and then you will name the file. Let's name it Galveston Island. By the way, uh, when you name shape files or, uh, or data files like rasters or features, you don't put a space, you put underscore. So Galveston Island, and then we will say them and to make sure it's in meters. So I will put M just to mean like this is a meter. And usually it asks you about raster data set, name was extension. You will have to put the extension of the file. So usually the raster has extensive is called TIF, T-I-F. So rasters, raster has extension, you name the file, and then you put .tif. Shape files, which is for discrete data or like buildings. So they are .shp, shape. This is the extension of the file. Like you have a Word document .doc or Excel, XLX. Okay, so I, I need to put the extension. I put .tif. And it asks you about the spatial reference for this raster. You can uh, pick the one that's already used. Actually, if you want to be consistent and you don't know what extension to use and you already start processing the data, you can choose the file, one of the files that we have here, maybe the Galveston County Island building points and take the projection from this file and project it on the raster map. How? You can come here and say import and you go to your shape files and then Galveston County Island buildings points and I will say add. If I did this, I will find this. This is the projection of the, the shape files, this shape file. I want to use it for my new rasters. Okay, so this is a one way to do it. Or you go here to say, say new and then you look for a new one. So either you import one or you add a new one. Anyway, uh, I will click on this one, which it was already here. And then I will say, okay. And here, the second one, it asks you about the pixel type. So the pixel type, I usually pick 32-bit float. So float allow us to, if we have, uh, like decimals, like if you if your raster say your raster data as I told you before, if I have my raster data something like this, and one pixel has decimals like 3.12, I need to keep this 3.12 without rounding. So this is how we do it. And actually most of them doing it, but this is how um comfortable with. 32 bit float. The cell size, I will keep it. So if I keep the cell size empty, it will take the same cell size in the original one. It will not change it. Uh, the last one is the number of bands. Usually the dem has only one band, one color, which is like either black and white. There is some uh, raster map that has multiple col colors, red, green, and blue. So my map is one band. If you want to make sure you can come here, and go to, um, what is this? Okay, I will show you in a, in a minute. Like when I click on this one, I will show you the number of bands. And then I will hit okay, I will keep everything the same and it will take maybe like two minutes or one minute until they merge the two rasters together.
Do you guys need know what what do I need the rasters for? Like the ground elevation. Like flooding, right? Exactly. So if if I work with flooding and I have a water surface elevation, this maps will tell me what is the flood depth. I have the water surface elevation tells you what is the elevation of the water, but you need the elevation of the ground to calculate the water depths. So I subtract the two maps or the two values from each other to get the amount of water depths. So this is, I believe the, and also if you want to know uh, the ground elevations, like I, I was about to, to tell the Versa floor elevation. So the Versa floor elevation, if you know the elevation of the Versa floor from the ground, with respect to the mean sea level, so you need also the ground elevation to do it. Like for example, when we uh, did analysis for Galveston County, we didn't have Versa floor elevation. And when we do flooding, Versa floor elevation is very, very important. Because if you have your building elevated by one story, like 10 foot from the ground, and you assume this building on the ground, it will, it will be a big difference, right? Because you already have your building elevated. So if you have six feet of flooding, your building still doesn't have any damage. So what we did, we need to make assumption. We know information about the foundation type. So if the building is on a slab and grave foundation, we, you can make assumptions about the various floor elevation. If it's on a crawl space, you can say that this building, if on a crawl space foundation, so this building might be elevated by four to six feet. But if you're building on a bile foundation, so this building might be on a 10 feet. So we made this assumption and we are measuring this from the ground. So we need the ground to sum up the new elevations. Okay, so here the analysis is done and we have our new map here. Uh, I will click on properties on the old one just to show you where, how, how can we know the number of bands in the original. Uh, you will find source. Sorry, you'll click on the maps here, double click, it will open. Uh, the tabs that have the properties and you will click on source, you will find the number of bands are one. So this is if you want to double check about the number of bands on the number of colors in the original one. You can change this, this actually, actually you can like, for example, you can click on this and change the colors if you want to see like the variation uh, in the elevation. So here's how it shows, like the lowest elevation is a red and as we goes in land, it turns to yellow, green, and then blue. So this is how the, the, the elevations look like. Okay, so right now I have the raster maps and I have my building points. Let's see how we can calculate the ground elevations of each building. So basically, as we learned last time, do you guys remember? If, if you don't remember, you just like, um, I say extract, value in the search. Sorry. Extract value. So you will find extract values to point. You can use this one because what we what we are gonna do right now, we want to extract the value of the ground elevation at each building point. So you can do extract values to point, extract multi-values to point. And that's the one that we used last time. Um, if you are familiar with ArcGIS as you are working uh, a lot, so you can go to uh, Arc Tools and you will find a spatial analyst tool, extraction, and you will find it, extract multi-values to points. But I know this one, I don't know many other ones, so I usually use the search. So first thing it asks you for is the input points feature. So I have my Galveston building points. I want the elevation at these points. The raster, I will I will use this raster and I will put it here and let's name it is the ground. Actually, let's DEM meter. And then I will hit OK. All right, let me close this. The mission is complete. Let me open the shape file. And as I showed you last time, you will always find the value that you extracted at the last column. Like in new shape file, what we did, it keeps adds columns. So here, if I go to the last column, you will find what we got right now. We got 
six, one. This is something that I did before. Let me delete this one. So this is the one that we just named. It's the same thing. Yeah, if I want to delete this column, I will delete this, delete, and we will have our own ones. This is the one that we just developed. This is the, the ground elevation at each building. So right now, knowing the... Yeah. So right now, knowing the uh, ground elevation, like this is the ground elevation. And last time we had the water surface elevation. You guys remember last time we tried to get the flood depths, but we didn't have the, the digital elevation map. So right now we got the digital elevation map. We calculated the elevation of the ground and we have the water surface elevation at each point. So let's calculate the flood depths at each point. So what's the problem with this calculation right now? This one? Yeah. This is the one that has the, the elevation at each building from the ground, the ground elevation of each building. It's eliminated. What was that? How, how did we make that? No, we make the, we change, turn each building to one point. Yeah, la last time what we did, we had the building polygons like this. We convert these polygons to but we end up with having this blue points. Okay, so what we did, the tool that I just used right now, it's called extract multi values to points. Let's do it again. So I asked this tool to extract the elevation at each one of these points. So for like I put the, the building points here, and then I put the, the ground elevation or the digital elevation map here. And I named the final, like here, I will name it ground elevation in meter. You can do the same if you have the water surface elevation map. Like I have, nine, okay. When velocity. Okay. So water surface elevation. Yeah, this map. Okay. So You take this control C and come to here and put this here. I don't know why it doesn't copy and paste, but anyway. So I can add another map here. And then I, if I have the maps of the water surface elevation, and I can have another one for the water surface elevation. So I put the water surface elevation in and then extract the value of the ground elevations and the water surface elevation at each building point. Did I answer your question? But I'm subtracting from what? I didn't subtract yet. I'm just calculating the ground elevation at each single point. At each single point. Oh. Yes. And if I have another map for the water surface elevation, that's what we did last time, I can extract oh, at each... Oh, not subtract. Yeah. Oh, extract. Subtract. Yeah. Subtract. The subtract will come later, like in a few minutes. So here I have, this is what we did last time, the maximum water surface elevation at each point. And it's a meter. Do you guys remember we had it in meter and then we converted to feet? Yeah. So right now I have the dim in meter and the water surface elevation in meter. So I can use this to, I will add another field and I will name it add field and I will name it uh, flood, FL, depth meter and then i will say okay so i have an empty field that doesn't have anything so i will click on this and i will make field calculator and then what i want right now i want the water surface elevation in meter and then i subtract the digital elevation or dm meter so i subtract the elevations from the water surface elevation Okay, and then I will hit OK. It will take a minute. So right now, 
Actually, I have a problem here. What is the problem? When I created this one, can you see? It doesn't have any fraction. So I think I made shorting integers. So I want to capture the fraction. So I, I will delete it. I'll delete this one. Delete field. Yes. Let's create it again here from the table options. I will add field and I will change short integer to double and I will name it FL depth and we can say meter. Let's do it again. Okay, here, field calculator. Yeah, water surface elevation, same formula. And I will hit okay. Okay, right now we had the fractions. So right now you can see the flood depths at each building. So also one thing, if you want to at a specific building, let's check the polygons here. And I will click on this I, I is for identity, this blue circle that has I, I can click on it. And then I click at each single blue point like anyone, you will find all the data about this point. You will find the FID, the shape, the object ID, the shape area, parcel ID, and I will go all the way down and then you can know what is the flood depth at this building, 1.81. Okay, so let's zoom out. Zoom to this layer and let's turn this off. We already done with the digital elevation models, so we can turn them off. And I can zoom at any location, like maybe we go to something that is close to the coast here. Then I click on, on the identity and then you can zoom in at any one of these buildings. Let's zoom in this one. Click on this one. Okay, so right now we find some buildings has negative flood depths. What does this mean? Does anybody know? If we found negative flood depths, that means is the ground at some point is very, very high, and then the water is here, but what you did is you subtracted a higher thing from a lower thing. So you end up with having flood depths. That means what? That this building didn't got flooded, okay? So, you should at the end, because what we did is we did it for all the building, even the building that are not exposed to flooding or away from the land, like if we have an entire county, so only the building on the coastal, on the coastal area are exposed, but the buildings up there is not exposed. So you will end up with having zero. So what you do is you rank these buildings from the lowest to the biggest, you will find that here is the negative 6.5. And or like, let me show you two, two ways to do it. You can go down until you find the last negative number manually. Okay, here's the positive until I hit the various negative number. Yeah, so here is the various negative number. Okay, so I selected from the 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 up the all the negatives how you click on the one and then you keep your hands on shift and click on the last one it 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 selects all the buildings in between all the row rows in between or you can come here at select by attributes so let's clear the selection if you want to clear the selection you click you click on this white page this one the white selection clear selection you come here at select by attributes and you write a small formula. You select like here is all the fields that you have, FID, object ID, parcel ID. And I will go to flood depths meter, the field that I'm, I want to check. And, and I want all the values that are less than zero. And then I will hit okay. So it will click all the ones that are less than zero. And once I say apply, it will make this selection. You can take these and do some operation only on these buildings, just these buildings. So I can, 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 can select this one. And this is only the buildings that has flood depths less than zero, which means that these buildings are not flooded. So what I do, 
I will change the value here. I will click on this one and I will click field calculator and I will make all them equal to zero. So I convert them from negative to zero. Because if I take these values to a MATLAB code and do some processing, it will end up with messy things because you have negative values and your curve start from zero. So we need to like clean this mess before we take this to the programming side. Okay, so I'll click zero and I'm doing this operation only on the buildings that I selected. So here, when I click on this blue button, you will find that we have 3,927 3, buildings. Okay, so once I'm done, I go back to the, all the buildings here and then I can clear my selection and then I start working. So I calculate the flood depths only for the buildings that are exposed to uh, flooding. All right, does anybody have any question till now? Is everything clear? Okay, so this is for the uh, data. So what if I have two data files for the same buildings within the same city that have different data about these buildings and I want to merge them together? Like for example, for Galveston, we have two building inventory. Can I have one question for you? Yeah, sure. Uh, when, when the rest of the file assign the elevation, when, do interpolation or just if the point of the building falls into the- uh, Do interpolation. Point. Yeah, you do interpolation. But anyway, most of the buildings will be on one pixel. Like you have yes. single point and the pixel size definitely is much bigger than the point because the point and is the very, point very small. Point in the pixel, it exactly. And, but also I believe there is an option that um, you do bilinear, like when you click, uh, you do bilinear interpolation of values at point location. Like there is some interpolation if, I believe if there is some kind of like something that you can't, that they cannot calculate or doesn't have data, they calculate, calculate from the pixels around it. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, so I also wanted to add, just, I just noticed that the building you checked when we clicked on time, yeah. it showed us that that, um, that building was not for it. So but they are on the coast. Yes, they're on the coast. The, the thing is, even if you are on the coast, you might be you, it, like the ground might be very, very high and it, it didn't get flooded. So for Galveston County, actually, most of these buildings, like let's see, uh here, where's that? Oh, where is okay? This one. There was uh areas that were high. At this location and the the flooding the the flood okay let's let me get the flood depths from ikea yeah, here and let's put this on top of this one okay so here this is how the flood depths look like for galveston uh so here's the flood depths is high like uh 2.29 at this location and when it gets here it becomes low why? Because this land was higher land than the other one. This is 0 0.09, so here's high. And then if we go a little bit inside, it will be 0.79. So it was like almost zero here because this land is, is much higher than the, like here also as well. Can you see there's dark red in the middle? Okay, let me uh, remove these. Here, like these are like higher lands that didn't got flooded. Yeah. But here is 0.95, same thing like here. So there is areas that are like the ground is much higher. So it's based on the ground. Okay. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. What was that? What was your question? I forgot. Oh yeah, the interpolation part. So um, I just like don't use the bilinear when I do the... Uh, the points one i just like get the one that i have like if you check here this i'm not sure what is the pixel size of the this one but the pixel size here is very very small like if i go not sure if we can see it or not we will not be able to see the pixels it's very very small okay so let's move to the next part what if we want to merge different data for the same buildings? Okay, so I have another data set. It's called National Structure Inventory. This data set is developed by the Army Corps of Engineers, and it's different from the inventory that we have. 
let me have them here. Yeah, this one. Okay, so do you guys remember these blue points? These blue points is the one that we developed from the polygons, right? If you look here, you will find some blue points doesn't have red points like the National Structure Inventory. So that means that these two will have some discrepancy, like some data in this data file is not in this data file, and some data in this data file is not here. I will show you right now how this look like. Let's clear the blue, and let's zoom in. Maybe here. Okay, here how it looks like. That's what I'm talking about. You will have some building polygons. Uh, hopefully it will show up. Okay, it will not show up. Okay, let's zoom to the layer and then make a little bit of a zoom here. Yeah, here. I'm not sure if you guys can see it or not. Okay, so can you guys see? Yeah, here. Can you see? You have these building polygons, but the National Structure Inventory has only three points. So some of the data that here is not there. Also, you can see in many places here, I have polygons, but I don't have points. So this is, it depends on how is your data updated. Like maybe these buildings were recently developed or recently built. Maybe the data is missing something. So this one, we merge two data together. So sometimes it has ups and downs. Like sometimes we need for example, the National Structure Inventory has lots of economic information about the buildings. And our, our building inventory, the old one, has lots of physical information, like the number of historic construction material and all this information. We need to combine them together to do socio-physical economic analysis. Something about the physical to get damage, and the damage we need to convert it to economic losses. So that's how we, we want to merge the data together. So if we want to do it, you can here like at the national structure inventory you can click and you will find something is called join and relate you can click on join and relate and do join this data with other data so there are different ways to do this join this we just add as the points or the polygons it's points the points the yeah are the, the polygons is the previous one and we convert it to the blue one which is another points for the same data I'm not seeing, so it puts the points over each other. Yeah, yeah, I, but here I, I uncheck them. Like I, I uncheck the blue one. You can check it. Like the one on the top, it shows. Like uh, here, can you see they are on the top of each other? I'm not sure when I zoom very close, uh, it doesn't load. Mm. To a layer. Doctor, what if they have uh, overlapping data? You can select which data to get from each file. I will tell you how is the join. Actually, what, what will happen is when you merge them, it will keep all the rows from the old data like this and put the new rows from the new data like this. So they don't merge the data together. You merge, you put them together. Like you have a 500 columns from this data and 1,000 columns from this data. So you will end up with having 1,500 columns. Uh, this one yeah yeah so this is the difference this between the yeah i don't want to zoom in it will not zoom oh, okay okay yeah so these two points is from different data it hasn't to be in the middle because the national structure inventory only provided points they didn't actually it was an excel sheet and i converted this excel sheet to a shape file i'm going to show you how can we we do this so they didn't provide shape files. They provide Excel with latitude and longitude. The only way to convert this latitude and longitude is just for a specific location. So what I did, I converted two points. I cannot convert latitude and longitude to polygons. 
because a single point can be a square building, can be something. So I convert it to a point and then show them here. Okay. Now for the same house, we will have like two records or two rows of data. Uh, no. Uh, so for the same house, you will have the old inventory and the, another inventory. They are together at the same one. I will show you how to merge them. I mean, how the software will know, like, now we have two, two points, not exactly the application, right? Okay. So yeah. how the software will know, like... So you can do it with either two things. First, if, if, like, this is, let's assume this is the old data, and this is the new data, old and new. If any of them have something in common, like this inventory has what's called building ID, and this one has building ID, so you'll ask the software if both building points has the same building ID, merge them together. This one thing, but the, the thing that we have, most of the buildings doesn't have building IDs. So you will ask the software if these two buildings are very, very close to each other, merge them together. Or you can measure with a polygon. Like you will say, if this is my old inventory as a polygon and my new inventory as a point. So you'll end up with having maybe the point here or maybe here. It doesn't have to be in the middle. If it's within the building or around the building with a specific buffer, you can ask the software to merge them. Okay, let's see how we can do them. So here you will have Island National Structure Inventory. You can actually select any of them. Like I can select the National Structure Inventory and do the join or I can select the building points and do the join. You can do whatever. So, so the base will be the one that you selected and the one will be added is will be the secondary one. So let's make this one is the base, like this one. And then I will say join. Here we'll ask you the two things. Do you want to make the join based on attribute from the other table. Attributes mean something like the building ID. Mm -hmm. This is attribute. Every number is called attribute. Or you want to join the data from another layer based on the station location. Okay, That's the one that I most use based on the station location because most of the data sometimes don't have something in common. But actually, be honest, I got some data that has building IDs. So they have building IDs or parcel ID. Barca ID also, you can use it. All right, so let's uh, do the first one. Uh, let's see if they have something in common. Like let's open this data. And they have what is called FDID, BID. Okay, uh, let's do something. Uh, let's uh, zoom to the layer. And let me zoom in. All right, let me click on this point and see what is the ID of this point. So this, I, this has F the ID for eight, one eight six six. Okay, let me remove this layer and show the blue one. So you don't have the same ID. I have object ID, I have parcel ID. So don't use the FID. FID is the one that ArcGIS do by default. Like they number the building from one to three. So we use we we look for other IDs. So there is no IDs that we can merge based on, but actually there is parcel ID. Here's the parcel ID 3505. So let's see the other data. And let's see if there is parcel ID. Square foot. I can see any parcel ID here. Okay, so there's no ID to merge based on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna merge based on the spatial location. The best way to do it, like I will merge this with this polygon's data. So I will go here and then I'll say join and I'll join based on the spatial location and I will select the layer that I want to merge it with. So I can merge it with the 
Galveston County Island building points. Because if you have a point, you will be able to merge it with another point. Let's see what if we isolate this and I will say join and do the merge based on the spatial location. You can merge polygons with points, okay? Because the polygons can have the point, okay? Right, so I can do this and I will end up with having polygons with the new structure building inventory. This is the best way actually to do the merge. Like you have an old data in terms of polygons and then you take this points. See, at this point here, when you merge this data with this polygons and then you can convert the new polygons to points. So you will end up with having points that has both data. All right, so here I will go to I will select this, but make sure that you don't click this one. You click this one. Each polygon will be given all the attributes points uh, that uh, that is closest to its boundary and distance field, and then you will hit OK. Because if you click on this one, it will not add all the data. It will add selective data. I want all the columns. And then I will say OK. And actually, you can save the new files here, and you can give it a name. Maybe we can name it. Uh, NSI merged, and I'll say okay. This might take a little bit of a time because it will have to review like if each data is within the buffer. So it might take maybe five minutes, depends on how long is your process is. Uh, you can set it, I believe. Uh, about the joining data. If you click about the joining data, you will know how to set it. But actually, uh, most of the time it's accurate when I keep it as default, like. Um, yep. Uh, so is it interesting, ArcGIS? You guys, was this? More than the Definitely. <laughs> we'll be honest when I was a student and taking this class. <laughs> yeah, I was like really stressed. Yeah. But actually it was much bigger than, because it doesn't have any ArcGIS. So we talk lots of theoretical things more than what I give, but I didn't use them. That's why when I, I'm teaching this class, I'm teaching what you guys might use. So even the things that we learn, we might, you might not use all of them. So, but I believe this is the lowest knowledge that you will have to know about the risk and reliability when we do our analysis. This is the lowest amount of knowledge. But this is stuff like maybe you are doing like building level analysis and you want to shift for other things like do community level applications. So this actually will boost your thesis, like because you did something at the community level, like you are not thinking about just your building, you are thinking about your the entire community. And it's a very easy. You just search the data, search for the buildings, do some data analysis, and then maybe you are developing something for your building, use your other colleague data like fragility, damage functions. You get something online, you get something that somebody also other some others develop and use them, and you have something at the community level. Great. So we are waiting for this to merge. The next application will be. Uh, how to convert data points. If I give you some points that has data, how can we convert them to rasters? For example, if we have Hurricane Michael that happens in 2000, that happened in 2000, 2018, and the data that I have for the wind speed, the three second gas wind speed or the sustained wind speed is in terms of points, tells you at this point, this is the recorded wind speed. And at this point, this is the recorded wind speed. What I want to use is, is the uh, a raster map of the wind speed. So I want to develop this out of that. So let's see how can we do it. I will open another ArcGIS window. So how do you guys would like the project to be? Do you want to pick your own things to do? 
or do you guys prefer that I send you some data and you do what you are asked to do? I think you guys will have the same thing. Maybe that's what I'm thinking about right now. It's just like give you same city. Like I have Lumberton, like the one that I showed you. And this will be a new thing. And I have hazard maps, like 100 year hazard map, 200 year hazard map, 500 year hazard map, 1000 year hazard map. And every one of you will get the same data, but different hazard maps. And then you will do the analysis. And maybe at the end of the class, you guys get together, merge your work together, and have maybe a paper about the impacts of the different return periods of different flooding on Lumberton, and then shows the impacts based on the return period. Like, and you, then you can bear with real hurricane, like Hurricane Matthew. How does Matthew look like with the other return periods? Maybe something uh, like this. How about this idea? Is it good? Okay, all right. Uh, I might do this. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so actually here's the merge happened. Uh, so if you click on this data and you said open attribute table, you will find here is the, uh, where it is? Okay, yeah. So this is the end of the old data and then the new data start from here, FID2. Can you see? This is, the old data FID, and then the new data, you will find it from here, something like this. So the two data get together. All right, so the next application is, um, I have here an Excel file that has 2018 Hurricane Michael, when the grid Okay, this grid this grid has the latitude, longitude and the wind speed, the gust wind speed and the sustained wind speed. The gust is always more than the sustained because the gust is the much the bigger and the sustained is the uh, is an average on a long time. And we want to the various I want to convert this to raster. Can you imagine? I have an excel file of points and I want to convert to raster. Discrete data, I want to convert it to continuous data. The first we will convert this discrete data from Excel to discrete data as a shape file, and then from shape file to raster. Let's see how can we do it. Okay, so what I, I will do, I'll come here, I'll say file, add data, and this is XY data because I have latitude and longitude, and I will, Check the location. So here's the location of the data. I believe it's this one. I will add and the X as we agreed last time. The X is the longitude because the longitudes are vertical and keep it changing on X. The latitude it changes changes over Y. So what happens here? He will ask you what is the field in this Excel file that has the the X values. So if you check this one. The X values is in the longitude. So the, the field is name is LON. So find here, he already detect that. Longitude and latitude. And then we don't have any Z and I will hit okay. And I'll ask you the table you specified doesn't have object ID. Okay, add object ID. All right, so let's see if this data Okay, here. Let's, I can see the data, you need to zoom in. So you will zoom to the layer because right now we are in Galveston, uh, Galveston, Texas. And this one is not Galveston. This is one is close to Florida, but this is not the hurricane. This is the hurricane. Oh yeah, here it is. Can you see this point? You cannot see them because all this black area has points. There's hundreds of thousands of points close to each other. If you zoom in, yeah, here, can you see it? This point, it's in red. Yeah, this one. 
Okay. And let's, uh, okay, I want to convert these points into rasters. And if you look at the structure of these points, let's zoom out, zoom to the layer, and then let's zoom at the landfall, the ground zero of Hurricane Mike. The ground zero of Hurricane Mike, when, uh, Michael, when he made landfall, it was at Mexico Beach here. So let's close out view at this location. As you can see, you will find like, I'm not sure if you see it or not, but they have the, the, the points are much denser at the shoreline. And when he goes out in the land, he make the mesh much bigger because the wind speed when it makes landfall is very, very high. But when it makes farther inland, it gets less. Okay. So as you can see here, like it will be very, very dense. And right now the mesh is very, very uniform. Okay. The second thing is I want to convert these points to raster. Actually, I don't. Can we see the data table? Yeah, you can open this here. Open attribute table. Here, the VGAST, the sustained wind speed, everything. And actually, this is not a shape file yet. This is still Excel. If you want to convert it to a shape file, you will click, right click data, and then export data. And you will export export all features. If you have a selected feature, you can sell, export the selected features. I want to export all the features and I want to save them here, Galveston, Texas. So let's go to the file that we are working on, FIU classes and shape file. And we will name this Hurricane Maipo Raster. When, let's say B. And we will say meter per second or not. Okay, let's save it. So what I did here, this will be a shape file. Can you see .shp? That means it will be a shape file. And then I'll say, okay, it will be, will take also some time. And then it will be, how many points we have? We have more than 1 million. At, I believe it's a meter per second. Oh, mile per hour here, MBH. So, uh, what I'm gonna use is the gust wind speed because this is how the fragilities are developed based because this is what we need to make sure is the fragility or the vulnerability of the buildings that we're, we are gonna use. When it was developed, is it based on the gust wind speed or the sustained wind speed? So sometimes when you have a figure in a paper, it says that the, this is the wind speed, the gust, the three second gust wind speed. So this is the one that we use. And actually there's conversions for the wind speeds. Like there is there is a way, there's some tables if you want to convert the wind speed from gust, because the gust wind speed is average on a three second. You can average the wind speed on 10 second, 20 second, one minute, 10 minute. Each in like lots of it, like many each engineer is using different ones. Like the coastal guys, I believe they are using the 10 minute average or the one minute average, not the three second guys. Okay, so right now I have the shape file that have Hurricane Michael wind speed. The second thing I want to convert this into a raster. So what I will do is uh, I will go to the search. And what I'm going to search is, is the keywords, which is say from point to raster. Let's see, uh, raster to point, point to raster here, very easy. Actually, I don't know where it is, but if you want, you can go here to conversion toolbox system, conversion tool. You will go to the conversion tool and then convert it. So how can we convert it? You will put your input file here, Hurricane Michael raster. Uh, where's the raster here? It says out, sorry. We are converting from point to raster. So we are putting the feature, which is the shape file input feature. And it asks you what feature or what value in this feature you want to convert. Okay, I want to make this raster based on the gust wind speed, the VG mile per hour. And then it asks you about the output file. 
And let's see, let's put it here. Uh, raster files. Okay, let's show file. Hurricane Michael. And let's name it Hurricane Michael. Dot def. Okay, we have it here. And then cell assignment, we can keep these. You can change the priority field to be the field that you are looking at, the VGUST, and you can adjust the cell size. But I, I believe it will use the cell size. Maybe you can adjust it, it might do some interpolation. You can do some search on how this point to raster thing is going on, like what is each one of these values mean, but I usually use the default one, unless I want to make the cell size much smaller. So I believe the software is gonna use like an optimizer and then interpolation to interpolate and make the mesh size as much less. And then I will say, okay, let's see how the raster will come together. All right, close. Okay, here's the raster, how it looks like. Let's zoom on this raster and let's remove this points. Not remove it, like uh, don't show it. I'll uncheck all these things and then I will zoom on this layer, zoom to the layer. This is how is the raster map look like. Let's, let's change the color so we can visualize how this thing look like. Okay, so this is how the wind speed of Hurricane Michael look like. So as you can see, the darker one here is the, the dark orange or the red is the maximum wind speed, 167 mile per hour. And as you go inland, this wind speed is keep getting decreased until like green. And, then, and as you can see also at, at the track, the wind speed is maximum. And when you go out to the track, it's wide. Like almost the wind speed is like 20 miles per hour, which is the regular wind speed in the streets. So over the track, here's how the wind speed is getting increased. So right now, if you have, but actually the pixel size of this is very big. Because if, can you imagine this is a raster map for the entire US? So definitely the raster size may be 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer. Or the point from point to point is like 10 kilometer. So it's not that big, but it's kind of a visualization that we can use to see how Hurricane Michael is making landfall. But if we really need to know how is the wind speed at a specific city, like let's zoom in and see Mexico Beach. Uh, let's actually, I have a Mexico Beach shape file. Do you guys remember Mexico Beach, the city that I showed you last time? Uh, okay, so let me add data. Actually, you can add data like this. You can have ArcGIS something like this and go to shapefile. Let's check. I have Mexico Beach. Okay, uh, my laptop. Oh, CRC project, Mexico Beach, GIS data. Okay, so this is the shape file. Like you will find shape source. You can grab it and put it here. Then you can make a close up view. Zoom to the layer. Okay, can you see? This is an entire city. It's not even a small pixel. Like the pixel is bigger. It's bigger than the city itself. Can you see? Here is Mexico Beach, and the pixel is very, very big. So this is not good to use, but it's good for visualization. If you want to know what is the wind speed at this pixel, you click on this pixel with the identity, it will tell you that the wind speed is 167 mile per hour, which makes sense because Hurricane Michael, when it made landfall, it was a cat four wind speed. Uh, this pixel here, it was 130 mile per hour. This pixel, 
it was like 102 mile per hour. So if I'm doing wind analysis, it doesn't make sense when you use it subtract the value to point. You can actually click all the points and assign the all of them have the same wind speed. So we need much higher resolution wind speed data if we want to proceed and want to know what is the wind damage for these uh, buildings. Right, so uh, next time we will have uh, an application where we'll see how can we convert what, or how can we see what we learn it from today to use it to identify vulnerability. We will use Galveston County, like the building that I showed you here. Zoom to the layer, Galveston, this one. And we will develop this MATLAB code that will use fragilities. And uh, with fragilities, first we, we will have the building points and we will bring the wind speed uh, maps for Galveston County from Hurricane Ike and do the same thing that we did with Mexico Beach and extract the wind speed at each building. And then we see how can we use the wind speed as an input for a fragility function for each building and get buildings damage. Okay. All right. That's it. And see you guys next time.